Are you a diver and you maybe even take photos or videos underwater? Then this live stream is for you. Because we believe that everyone who takes images underwater is already an ocean ambassador. And to make sure that you can do your job properly and inspire people out there to care for the ocean and eventually protect it, we collected your questions beforehand on social media. And we're going to ask those questions to creative professionals from the industry. And we are sending live from the world's largest water sports show here in Düsseldorf, the boat show, which is taking place from 18th to 26th of January. You want to find us live in Hall 11 at the Pixel World workshop stage. Make sure you follow us on social media, on the Behind the Mask Facebook page and on the Behind the Mask YouTube channel. Turn on your notifications and most importantly, ask your questions down in the comments and maybe we will even be able to pick up your question and forward your question to our guest. And one more thing, by leaving us a comment, you already have a chance to win amazing prizes. And hello everyone, we're back, two o'clock, the middle of the show, mm -hmm. everybody's still in good energy and you cannot only win amazing prizes, you can also actually win like real knowledge from people who know what they do. And this is a session that I was uh, looking forward uh, to do because we have a lot of information uh, in this one. And the guy who is doing that is Alex Tattersall. And the topic is macro photography. Alex, this Hello. is what you do mainly? Yeah, mainly. Mainly. That's what I love doing. Great. And we're not going to waste any time. Me sitting here talking. We actually swap places. Yeah, sure. So you can start. <coughs> okay. Thank you yeah, very much. Cool. We never get to hang out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sit very close. Do you want to come over here? <laughs> oh. Okay, so um, it's very nice to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Our pleasure. Um, I am. I originally decided to do a brief presentation about my top five tips for macro photography, which actually became a hundred more tips. like <laughs> about a hundred <laughs> tips, but five main themes. So mm. I'm going to try and go through this. Uh, I think that that uh, they will have access to these slides later yep. on. Is that right? Yeah. So you can. Um, You, you know, the, the listener and um, the viewer can g come back and look at these slides later on. But I, I'm going to run through this now and discuss some of the things from my own experience of, of uh, shooting macro for about 10 years, uh, what I think is important and what I think may help you. So it's all about you rather than me. So my first tip, top tip number one, is about the mindset. So this, this takes on a number of different factors. But what you need to be doing primarily is diving for photos. So you need to change your diving style to be diving for photos. So communication with guides and dive group to ensure that you are in a situation where you are actually focused on diving for photos to get these good results. You also need to be competent. This is a something that I see quite a lot. You see people, particularly macro photography, you need to be able to approach subjects very gently, very smoothly, very easily. And if you're not confident or not comfortable in the water, this is one of the, the, the reasons why the approach in the subject becomes difficult. <laughs> Diving within a comfort zone. With macro, you need to really focus. So you need to focus your mind, in my opinion. And if you're outside your comfort zone, this becomes problematic. If you're at a depth where you're not comfortable, if you're at a time where you're not comfortable, if you can't see any of the group, or you don't know where the boat is, then that becomes problematic. Before I approach the subject, any time I have a subject here and I want to approach my subject, the first thing I do is I think to myself, okay, how much time do I have left and how much air do I have left? That's the first thing that I do before any approach to any subject. So bear that in mind as well. Super important. Many people diving are holiday divers, but it, if, if you, rather than actually going away and trying to take 50 average shots of 50 different subjects, if you can focus your mind on getting two images, one or two images that you're happy with by the end of a, uh, by the end of a dive, then that way you'll be able to raise the bar and get something which is of higher quality. But obviously, some people are, are lucky enough to dive more than others. <coughs> 
This is very important for me, very close to my heart, respecting yeah. the environment. Um, we, we've seen a lot of uh, issues with various things going on, people using these sticks and, and, and doing various things with various critters. But I'm a, a, a big, a big um, advocate of um, not doing this and respecting mm -hmm. the environment and sure. subjects and also the divers. And this is something that's also which I, which I think is really important, is that we have this opportunity to do things um, and we have the opportunity to go down underwater, we have the opportunity to travel, but sometimes you forget how lucky you are. And it's always important to keep that in your mind. I see people coming up from dives sometimes and all they can focus on is the frustration of the photography. And they completely forget how lucky they are to actually have been underwater. Okay, so that's mindset. Any questions? So far, so no, good. No, it makes total sense so far. Okay, it's yeah. good. So far, so good. Five minutes in, good. Okay, so knowledge and research. Right. This is very, very important for the macro photography. If you can understand your subjects, if you can see, if you know the behavior of your subjects, then you can set your focus and know that that's a photogenic subject, for example. This, uh, this nudibranch here, if you haven't seen them before, they, they move along like this, and every, every second or so, they flare the skirt up like this. So if you sit there and observe them doing this, then you can know that at a certain point, this is going to happen, and that's the photo you're trying to get with, with this action that's going on. But it only happens as a result of researching the subject or observing the subject. Having good access to social, uh, social media, for example, if you are interested in macro photography, I advise that you do join the Underwater Macro Photography Group. Um, there are also several groups on, on Facebook where you can see images which will inspire you and you can see what other people are producing and things that you want to, want to, um, you know, want to work on as well. They also give the settings so you know what's, what, uh, not only what, which housings, which lenses the person's used, but also the settings they've used. So you can, you can use that to uh, kind of understand a bit more about the photography. And this is all important here. Very often you'll see a subject and you'll think, I really want this subject, and it just whoosh, it just disappears. We call this a non-player. You need to find a player, which is a subject which is happy to stay with you, and, do, and, and uh, then you can work that subject. Right, first, first thing in terms of um, choosing your subjects. Some subjects are very photogenic. Some subjects aren't so photogenic. So the excitement of seeing a seahorse, especially if you haven't seen many seahorses, you can be super excited, but you know that if you see a brown seahorse on a brown sandy bottom, it's going to be very difficult for you to get a striking image in, in any case. If you can find a white seahorse, this is going to make, instantly make a, make a better image. If you have a brown seahorse, this is in, in the UK, if you have a brown seahorse, then if you can frame it against something, a contrasting color, rather than just the, the, the sandy background, this will also produce an, uh, an image which is um, a, a lot more striking. Robust ghost pipefish, is this a good subject, do you think, for photography? Not really. It's, um, you can backlight them, you can get interesting shots with them, but it's very difficult to do anything which is, which is artful with these, with these animals. Whereas if you find a pipefish like this, this is the one that you want to spend your time, time with. So if a, if a dive guide points out to you that there, there's, your, um, there's your robust goat, ghost pipefish, you go, thank you very much, maybe one or two shots and think, this isn't really <laughs> going to work. But if you find a subject which has these lines, it has these, these contrasting colors, then this is the subject that you want to spend 15, 20 minutes working on if you can. Why? Because it's easier to focus or because the behavior is easier to photograph or why are you going to stick with this one or because you think it looks better? Because ultimately you're going to get a more, more striking image. Okay, yeah. because they hold their head up more often or? No, it's more to do with the color, I think. Mm. Color, yeah. the, uh, also the, the eye, I guess the eye on this one. If you look at the eye on this one over here, it's very difficult to kind of focus on the eye here. There's no, there's no real expression in it. What you're trying to get is eye contact. And a, and a pipefish like this does, does give you that eye contact. Mm. Ah, okay. And he already looks like a player. He is a player, yeah. yes. He's a very happy little player. Yeah. 
He was quite happy. <laughs> um, this is a sea lemon. So it's a nudibank. So you get some very photogenic nudibanks and some unphotogenic nudibanks. This one for me is an unphotogenic nudibank. This one here is a Whoa. super photogenic um, Janolus. And then this one, of course, is everyone's favorite, the, uh, the Shaun the Sheep. So you can tell the difference, can't you? If I, if I spend an hour working on this one here, I'm never going to get a shot which is actually going to be striking and, and, and interesting. OK, so choose your subjects. This is a subject which is, a, a, again, an awesome subject, worth spending an hour if you can. I spent an hour on this, on this photo. OK, so far so good? Mm -hmm. Right, next thing, recognizing potential. There are situations where you are never, ever going to get, well, you're almost never going to get a shot which is going to work. Here's a situation here. You have the nudie rank here. I've got this going on here. I can't get an angle on this at all. So um, all I can do is shoot it from the top. So I can maybe do something interesting from the top. But this is a, a, a subject in a, in, a, in a position which doesn't have much potential to get a good shot at the end. Whereas this one here, just on the top of exactly the same reef, so on, on, the, the, on the top of this, uh, this coral head, there was another nudie bank sitting there. And I could get the angle correct. I could get through there. I could do no damage to the, to the environment. And uh, wait for some kind of behavior. And you, you can see the difference between the two images, can't you? OK? Mm -hmm. If you understand your subjects, then you can also understand uh, where they live and wh which habitats they live on, because very often they, they can be uh, symbiotic relationships. For example, the zebra crab here. This is uh, on, a, on a fire urchin. And the combination of the two colors, the, 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 the Im this will produce a striking image, which is worth working on. OK, and this is, this is to do with listening to the guides, understanding the habitat, understanding the subjects. And uh, by doing that, then you, you, know, you, you're, you have a better, better, better opportunity to, uh, to get better pictures. Porcelain crabs, so these live on the anemone skirts. If you find a beautiful anemone skirt like this one, particularly striking with the, with the, with the orange dots, you can get purple skirts. You get all kinds of different skirts. You get very plain ones. But if you can focus on one which is photogenic like this one, then you will, you will produce a striking image. OK? Happy? Uh, you might notice I put all the settings and all this information here. So later on, if you want to download the slides, you can, you can pick those up. <laughs> this is in the UK. So a very, very tiny shrimp living in an anemone. I wanted to show you this because I'm showing you some very nice images, but I also want to show you the facts. And this, this is something which I think more of the professional photographers should do more often, is to reveal 99% of the images that they take, which, which will be like this one here. So if I go through and scroll through my, my camera and look at all the images that I've taken, 99% will be deletable. However, the difference is that I've I, I have an idea in my head, and I work towards that idea. So taking the shot, taking the shot, and actually having the idea in my head until, until I achieve that, and not stopping until I've achieved that. Do you have images like this? <laughs> we all do. There's a, there's a nice group on Facebook called Crap Fish Photography, which I do advise you have a look at. <laughs> Because it shows everyone can post their worst images. And it's, it's very, very humbling. Because in general, people don't want to show their worst images. But I, I think it's very useful to show this. Behaviors. So if you know your animals, if you know, if you know that you, your cardinal fish are mouth brooders, so if you see these images, you know that you might come across this when you see a group of cardinal fish. You can see this. these are undeveloped eggs here, which are a pinkish color. And then here, so just by following a bit further around, around the corner, I um, found one which had more developed eggs, which makes for a very different image. So you've got your caviar over here and your developed caviar over here. <laughs> so um, this is to do with understanding the behavior. 
watching the behavior. So this, this is feeding. So these, these are mackerel feeding in the water column. So they're, they're filter feeding. And we spent about four dives just hunt, chasing around after these mackerel. So at least four or five hours just there waiting for the mackerel to come in closer, get more and more confident, waiting for the shot, waiting for the shot. Okay. And when you know behaviors, you know that porcelain crabs feed like this when they're com comfortable, so you can get in nice and close. Territorial battles. Cleaning. So cleaning is an interesting thing. Um, it's worth hanging out on cleaning stations. You may even see this, which we found. <laughs> bit, of, <laughs> bit of humor there. <laughs> right. Uh, what I want to show you now. <clears throat> what do I want to show you now? OK, so we mentioned this, exposing yourself to good imagery, going on social media, finding people that you, that, whose images you like, participating in expert workshops. We'll talk about it later on. I, I do run workshops. There are several people that run workshops. And these, these are things which are very useful to hone your technique and to understand the subjects you're dealing with. There's many books as well, books on, on marine wildlife and behavior. But most importantly, get in the water as much as you can. Observe what's going on. OK, so that's top tip number two. <laughs> top tip number three, logistics and preparation. So this is also equal, equally important, knowing your equipment. So understanding your equipment, using your equipment on land. Especially with macro, you can take a macro lens, you can go out in the garden and you can shoot shoot flies, shoot animals, shoot anything, shoot textures, shoot plants. And by doing this, you get to learn, understand depth of field, understand all, these, all, these, um, all the things that you can actually apply underwater. Working within your, in, within your camera's limitations. So no matter what you have in terms of a camera, if you have a compact camera, if you have a large DSLR, you have to work within the limitations of the lens setup that you have. So if you have a 100 millimeter macro lens, you know that you're going to have to be focusing on subjects which are quite small, and you want to kind of avoid larger subjects. So you're always working with, limita with limitations. I know people that have a compact, and they look at me with a big DSLR, and they say, he's got a big DSLR. He's bound to get more better photos. Um, however, I'm also working with limitations, even with, with a DSLR. Never be discouraged, though, if, if something like a large whale shark arrives and you have a macro lens on. <laughs> you, can either <laughs> you can either work an image outside of the norm, so maybe take a photo of the eye or some, some remora stuck on, on the whale, whale shark, or just simply observe it and enjoy the moment, enjoy the experience. So logistics and preparation, top tip number three. OK? Keep going. I don't know if you have this experience, but what I try to encourage my workshop guests to do is to get themselves into the zone. So when you're underwater, the meditative breathing that you're, is happening will take you into, into a kind of a, a, a relaxed meditative state, which is quite addictive. I think most of you mm -hmm. divers will probably, will probably understand that. Makes you forget about everything else. Yeah. Well, if you can get yourself into this zone with the camera, then this is where your, you know, the enjoyment and the uh, the results will come as a, as a result of of this. Okay. Top tip number four. <laughs> Training technique. First thing, we talked about it very briefly a minute ago, accessibility of the subject. So this frogfish here, well, I, I've had to um, improvise a camera here because I, d I didn't want to um, do any, I didn't want to bring any uh, brands on the stage. Is so, there anything camp's newest housing? So I had to go to the gas station and produce this. Do you need anything else? Not yet. Because you have a lot, a lot of cool things in your bag. <laughs> Right, so this, this, is, this is, I want you to imagine this is my camera. I took the handles off for, for transit, and I took the viewfinder off as well. Right, so I have a subject here, and my frogfish is here, 
And I, I really want to get kind of an angle up like this on the frogfish, but there's absolutely no way that I can do that without disturbing the animal. So rather than disturb the animal, I just move away from the animal, leave the animal, and consider this a subject which I, I'm, I'm not going to work on. And I'll look around the reef and find something where I can access the subject. So here I can get a nice line through with the blue water. There's another frogfish in the back here. And that was an accessible subject. So recognizing when, when there's potential to get a good image is all important. This is quite a, a tragic picture here. We were in Wadi Lakhmi in Egypt, and there's this beautiful red skirted anemone, very uh, Red Sea. And up here in the evening will be the sun coming down. And if you take the shot like this, then you can get the red anemone with the sun burst in the background, a very beautiful shot. But someone decided, obviously, that they, they couldn't get their camera low enough. Well, not obviously, but this is what I'm concluding. So I don't know if you can see this, but someone has systematically oh, yeah. snapped off yeah. the coral heads and put them here. Nasty, huh? Obviously, that is completely unacceptable. But I do know people that will do things like this to get the shot. So don't, don't let that be one of, one of us. This is really a useful tip. One of my, one of my favorite tips is fallback settings. If you look at the, um, most of the images that I've shown you so far, they have very similar settings. And these are what I call my fallback settings. So if, if I use F22, 1 ISO 400 on my DSLR, I'm pretty much sure I know what's going to happen, what the result is going to be. So that, that could be my startup setting. Um, if I was using a mirrorless, then I'd, I'd open the aperture a little bit, compacts equally. So th this, is, this is where I kind of start with. And I know that I'm going to get a lot of depth of field. I know how much light I need, how much power I need on my strobes. Um, and if, if I want to stray from that and do something more artistic, where I'm using shallower depth of fields, or if I'm using slower shutter speeds, if I see an action that's happening, maybe, maybe I don't know, uh, two, uh, two fish start fighting over here, the first thing I do is go straight back to those, these settings. So the f while I'm moving across, I'm mo moving this, changing this, changing this, look, back over here, and then I can get, I, I'm back to the, my, my settings that I know are going to work and give me the depth of field for, for the behavior that I want. How are we doing for time? Settings. So these are my fallback settings. So this is two mantis shrimps, mantis shrimp who are, which are fighting. So I was artistically photographing some textures over here. And someone did the tank bang. And I looked over, and I saw these two mantis shrimp. <laughs> so as I'm moving across, I'm changing, changing to get back to these, these settings, where I know I'm going to have enough depth of field to get the whole of, of the action into one shot. OK? Right, this is also very, very important. I have to get my strobes now. <laughs> I like these strobes. <laughs> I thought I did mean to mean for them to be full, but they, somehow I, they're not. I think you need to charge them. <laughs> these are the tastiest strobes I've, I've ever had. <laughs> right, so these are my strobes, just for the, for, the, for the benefit of this. So what we need to do, I, I, I'm, I want to photograph a pygmy seahorse. So I, uh, someone finds a pygmy seahorse on a gorgonian over here. It's a pink gorgonian. So before I do anything, before, before I even start thinking about it, I go over, I find something else, which is a pink color, like this. And I'd make all the settings, all the changes to the camera, to the strobes, all on that benign piece of, uh, piece of similar colored um, coral. So that I know my exposure is correct. I know what my depth of field is going to be. And I, I know all that. And once I've got it all set up, then and only then do I approach my subject. And then I can take maybe five, six shots, boom, bang, bang, bang. 
And I know that the exp I'm not going to have to change my exposure and do this because everything's set up already before I, get, before I do, do that. Yeah. Now, with a pygmy seahorse, this is important because you don't want to stress the pygmy seahorse out. But it's, it's even more important when you have a subject which is very skittish because you may only have one chance to get the shot of it. An another important point, if I'm trying to get blue water in my background, then if, my su if I know my subject is here, and I want to practice my shot, then I do a similar thing over here, shooting in the same direction where the, th where, the, where the blue water column will be. If I take a shot like that, then the blue will be a different shade of blue. But if I shoot it in the same direction, I can make my changes, get, get, get my blue to be a nice color, and then I can go in and approach my subject, bang, 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 done, finished. All too often, I see people like bl blast it and, it, and it just completely blasts the picture. And they start doing all this with the pygmy seahorse, and then they can't find it, and the pygmy seahorse is, 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 is gone. OK, so that's important. Stabilizing yourself. These are useful. I look pretty uncomfortable here. <laughs> but what I'm doing, it, look, it actually looks like I'm lying on the reef, but I'm not. That's, that's not what I, what I like doing. So I've got my, my thing here. I'm using that on a rock, and I'm shooting down like this. Legs in the air. I've got my floats on here, which are, which are enough to, uh, to make the whole thing neutrally buoyant. So it's very easy for me to manipulate the camera. Can you see what I'm shooting? No. This is the picture that came out of it. Oh, OK. Nice. Wow. So there's a tiny little nudie bank on here. <laughs> Same again, and we're, we're going to discuss this shortly if I, have to, if, if I have a chance. Stabilizing yourself. So if, you, if there's a rocky surface, this is on a sandy bottom. If, if you can find a rock, a piece of rock, where you can actually have your, use your two fingers to hold, hold on here, and then you can rest the camera housing on here, then you can move back and forwards and, and make these small movements to get when you see things come in focus, you take the shot, take the shot, take the shot. Equally here on the sand, I've got this like this, so that I can just basically rock it backwards and forwards. Do you want to see the photo, what, which is from this? So this is wow. using the, the white slate yeah. as a background. <laughs> Ow. Top tip number four. This is a lot of information for people. Back button focus. If your camera allows you to back button focus, this is absolutely well, this, this is one of the most important things for me to get good macro photography. So, and also, well, equally for wide angle photography, any, any kind of uh, animal photography. Back button focus means that you set the camera up so it focuses on a button on the back of the camera. So, not, not on the shutter. So, I take it off the shutter and I put it onto a button at the back. Now, what I can do there, if I have a super macro lens on, for example, here, I can press the button, and, and I can see it zooming, uh, focusing in and out. And I can stop kind of about around here. Then I can rest this on here like this. And now, basically, I'm in manual focus. So all I need to do is move myself backwards and forwards. And when I see the subject come in and out of focus in the viewfinder, then I can fire away, fire away, fire away. OK, so back button focus imperative. Wow. And you can see me there. So I'm using the thumb, in this case, to do the focus here. And you can see me again here, using the thumb here, getting the focus like that, and then rocking backwards and forwards to take the shot here. So that's my top tip number four, training your technique. And the final one, this is supposed to be five, five tips, but <clears throat> artistic visions. So that I'm going to have to run through these quite quickly again, but artistic vision. So going beyond your average shot, two subjects, maybe one here and one here on the same dive. I took this one just to, just to demonstrate. So you've got your goby over here. Which one's more attractive, that one on the left? The blue one. The blue one. Mm -hmm. And why is it more attractive? No. 
know, maybe because of the color contrast? The color contrast, or what we call the negative space. So all this negative space we call. <clears throat> so clearly this is an, is an unattractive background, whereas this one makes a much nicer background, a much more striking image. So focusing on your backgrounds. This guy here was in Mexico. He's over here. And then I took a couple of shots and thought, well, this, this background's pretty, pretty unattractive. So I just moved across and found one of, a similar in a coral head. <laughs> Which one's nicer? This one or this one? Hmm. Yeah. Much more striking, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. OK, so the last couple of points are, are to do with stepping outside of my fallback settings. So you can see here I've got my F20, my 1200, my ISO 400. And this is an, uh, an image that I would get when I'm shooting my strobes pointing forward like this. And I, the result is a very, very beautiful anemone fish. But it's, it's more of an ID shot, really. It's not, not particularly artistic. Because you have such nice colors on this, nice colors on the pectoral fins, it's um, looking at su for subjects like that, which have these colors, have these markings going away. If you use shallower depth of field, then you can result in much nicer, more artistic pictures. So here I've used an F9, which is a shallower depth of field. And I've also used inward lighting. So rather than having my lights face like that, can people see this on the, on the, on the screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're watching it pretty well. So the, stro the strobes are actually pointing in like that. So I have a brush of light coming across on both of these strobes, like so. And that lights the front of the subject and lights the, the front of the anemone, but not the whole of the background. So inward lighting is awesome. F7.1, you can see if you start being artistic with, with color, then you can get things which look like oil paintings. This is with a Nauticam Super Macro Converter. I have to say that. Can't believe it. Super nice. <laughs> um, stepping away from the what fullback settings, using slow shutter speeds. We haven't got much time to go into this, but you've seen this fish before? So the fish moves like this. So a fish which is moving like this, if you do a slow shutter speed, but you have enough uh, ambient light coming in, then you can follow the trails of the image. So this is stepping outside by using slow shutter speed. Turning an image like this with my standard settings to one like this, hmm. using one tenth. Did you move the camera for this? Yes. Uh, yeah. I did. And I turned it as well. So I, whereas here I'm straight on, the second one, I turn it like that. Ah. Move like that. Oh, amazing. Wet lenses. So macro wet lenses are absolutely vital. And there are some lenses which are better than others, but I can't, I can't talk too much about that. But I'll just show this, this very briefly. And that's enough for that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Look at this, super macro. So this is my finger here. So can you see in here, there's an octopus, tiny octopus living in a shell. So what I can do using a, one of the super macro converters is I can get an image like this. This is actually a bag of marbles that I have here, which I put behind for a background. So a bag of blue marbles. So here I put the blue marbles behind it, shot it through, and I get the blue background here. And if I want to go with a super, super macro, then the SMC2, super macro converter 2, then I can get this detail of the eye as something which is absolutely minuscule. So if you're interested in super macro, there are some very powerful tools out there. Look at this. Can you see this? This is, this is in a current, a very strong current. And this is lying down because of the current. So here we have a tiny nudibranch. You can see how small that is. That, that's, this is like one of these pointy sticks next to it. So with the super macro, wow. and then with the super macro too, wow. you can fill the frame with this, these absolutely tiny critters. And this is, this is where it's vital that you get this technique of back button focus, rocking backwards and forwards. And when you see the subject come in focus, you can fire, fire, fire. 
The big difference, of course, is in between shots, you don't have to wait for the, the camera to, to focus between each shot. If you're on the shutter only, then between each shot, you're focusing like that, take the photo, take another shot, focusing, take the photo. With back button focus, you can focus, let go, and you can go bang, 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 bang as you're moving in and out. Wow. Good. And then, so this is the end of my stick. You see what that little yellow thing is? Ay, ay, ay. It's amazing, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. So th this gives you s such amazing insight into, s into the structures, into the textures, and, and these, these lovely, beautiful little creatures. So that brings me to the end of my, uh, my top tips. So that's number five of my top tips. So I think I have some questions now. If everyone has questions, just raise your hand. You get a microphone. Um, are you checking? Like, how, how do you deal? Like, you check all your photos you do underwater, right there underwater, and you improve on what you see? Um, this, this is, that's a good, good point, actually. Uh, when, I, when I used to go diving, I'd, I'd be very quick. And this, this might happen to you as well. You might take some photos, and you think, oh, that'll do. I'll sort it out later. But that, or I'll go, I'll go back in the second dive and maybe get that shot later. But this is, this is not the mentality to have. You need to stay there until you've got that image and you know that that image is there. You can feel it when you've got the image, actually. You know that, you, you know that you've nailed it. Most of the time, you know that you've got it. But then I w I'd always check, yeah, absolutely check, and I'd zoom in and make sure it's all in focus. Um, but the point is not to expect the next dive to be the same, because it really isn't. As you know, every, every single dive is going to be different. <clears throat> so get the shot before you come up. And you have to have very, very uh, patient buddies or, no, or solo diving qualifications. You mentioned earlier that uh, sometimes you see a subject that you would actually like to photograph, but it's not in the right position because you're not going to be able to you know, position yourself well or anything. I got to the point now where I don't like, like that to, to happen. <laughs> but yeah, I, w I will circle around again if I th really think it's a subject that I want. But there's, a, there's always something, with macro, there's always something else. Even if it's just a texture. So you can always find something else. Yeah. That's the beauty of macro. You can, and you can do it anywhere. And if you do it in cold water, then with thick gloves, then when you come to go to the tropics, it's, it's so, so much nicer and so much easier. I've got a question here. Shall I, shall I go on this question? Hazel, yeah. hazel nut. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This <laughs> is, like uh, the these are the questions that we have from the community. But I think before we go to this, I think thank you very much yeah. for thank the insights. <laughs> Learned a lot. And you're going to be uh, available online and checking comments and asking yeah. uh, any questions. Certainly. Really interesting. Should we? I'd like to win a holiday. Should we uh, <laughs> switch places again? Yeah, if you like. OK. I've got some, some slides though for this. Yeah, no, that's OK. We can uh, go through it. This, okay, is, thanks. this is yours. Can I keep your camera? <laughs> <laughs> yes. There's a taco kit inside there. Yeah. No, I can, I can uh, go through it. Okay, do you want to flick through them? Okay, good. Ah, cool. We have like a mixture of some of the photos still and some yes. things and uh, some community questions. Okay, cool. Yeah, because we kind of get a little bit late with our things always and we not get to ask all our community questions. So I think we moved it forward a little bit. So Hazel is asking, can you give us tips to get the perfect black background that isolates the subject? Yes. Okay, so this, this is a good example of this. Um, so th there's several ways of getting a good black background. The first one is to have a water column behind your subject. So you're shooting into the water column. So rather than having rocks like this as a, as a, a rock, rocky outcrop, wait until the subject crawls to the top of a rock so you can shoot underneath and get, get the water column in the background. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to have shutter speed, which is fast enough, aperture, which is small enough, to not let any light at all in, which is called ambient light. So the only light that's coming through is from the strobes, the two strobe lights. Um, and this is an example. So this one here, I was just watching it. It was flaring up its skirt as it went along, flaring up its skirt. And then it started crawling over the rock. And then this is where you can get underneath. It's a single strobe here. So a single strobe shooting down on this side. And this kind of reveals the transparency of the subject. So that's your, the first way of doing it. This is what I was talking about, about ambient light. So if you have 
my standard backup, my standard settings, then this will generally result in no ambient light coming into the, into the frame. Um, and you'll end up with a back, back, black background. If we go to a, a, either a more open aperture or a slower shutter speed or a higher ISO sensitivity to light, then you'll end up getting ambient light into the frame and you'll end up with, with different water, co water color. Okay? This uh, skeleton shrimp here was here. I was shooting it, it was on the sand. And then I thought, well, this, it's, it's kind of a bit lost, isn't it? OK. Um, so what I did was I took my torch off, put it behind the subject, and there's my black background behind the subject. Do we have a question? Yeah, it was just one question that I noticed on the live stream regarding all the way at the beginning when you were talking about subjects that you can work with as opposed to subjects that you wouldn't be able to work with. So the question that was being asked is, for those scenarios where you can work with the subject and you're not looking for a, a very specific shot, is there a certain routine that you go through in terms of certain shots that you want to nail, like your standard? Is there a, a, like an objective that you have for each, like each situation? Uh, I guess it varies on situation to situation. But it is a little bit like stamp collecting, I guess, when you have subjects and you haven't shot them before. But what you have to do when you see a subject, you can look at the subject, and then they might look back at you, and then they might start to freak out, or they might just start <laughs> to relax. And then you look at them and think about, think about before you approach how you're going to make the shot. So you have to be like, mindful of what you're actually trying. Am I going to try and do, do a portrait shot, uh, landscape? Can I get low? Look yeah. at the whole environment and see what you can, what, how you can approach it. Yeah. So it really depends. Right. Inward lighting very quickly. I talked about this earlier. So this is your standard light coming forward, where you are lighting the subject and the background. This is inward lighting, where, you're light, where the, the beams of the light are hitting the subject, but they're not hitting the background. And this is, this is a very useful technique to get, this is a straight on, and this is inward lighting. This is straight on, and you can see all this here. And then this is inward lighting. So that, that's a good way of, very good way of isolating a subject through inward lighting. Straight head, inward lighting. Wow. Wow. Useful. <laughs> Another thing here, this is on, on a kelp in Canada. And this is on, this is on a kind of a black stone, a brownie black stone. So that's another way that I've managed to get black backgrounds with these two subjects. So I selected this color, which was dark brown, and then brought the color down in, in post. Ah. Snoots, blue octopus with a standard flash, a snoot light, which focuses the beam. It goes on your strobe, focuses the beam, and then you can get isolated subjects. Wow. That's another way of getting black backgrounds. Wow. Very impressing. What's the best way to learn shooting with snoots? Uh, the first thing is to buy a snoot. <laughs> I can give you a good address, a good website address if you need it. Um, snoots are, so if you don't know what a snoot is, I, I, did bring, I didn't bring my snoot, unfortunately. <laughs> Actually, I, I forgot about my diopter holder here. My flip diopter holder. <laughs> <laughs> I was very busy last night. So if I, if I had my strobe like this, actually, let me get the camera. Put, put the, uh, the dabs on. So uh, if you imagine on my arm, uh, I'm like this. Subject's over here. First thing, subject's over here. I stay well away from the subject to begin with. I come over to find a very similar color and reflectivity over here on a rock or whatever. And then I focus with the back button focus, get it in focus, let go. Don't touch that again. Move this around until I can see the light spot. And then I tighten up all the arms so that everything is totally tight. And then I move everything over like this. And then when I see the light on the subject, it should pretty much be in focus based on, 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 on all this. So I can just take shots, take shots. If I need to maybe make, make a modification, and then you can just very gently move around. 
And snoot means that there is only one pointed light beam coming. Normally, out. it's one pointed light beam, but it's it's kind of like a funnel which funnels mm -hmm. the light down into into a general point. Um, when you look at f snooted shots, they they are very impactful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right, so they're very impactful. <coughs> and you can <hear>. Thanks. <laughs> and and you can uh, you can make a subject like this, which is not particularly attractive. So you, this is a C pen. <coughs> By using a, a targeted snoot light, you can isolate single polyps. Or more attractive, I, th I, f I find, is that you have one strobe here, very gently, very soft light, the other strobe here, and then you're isolating one subject and you're giving a very little tickle of light from the front, so that rather than having a staged setup, you have a setup where you also have a bit of, bit of um, excitement in the background. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <clears throat> Do you personally think the difference in quality is that noticeable between wet <coughs> diopters on top of standard lenses and using designed macro lenses instead of wet diopters? OK, so this depends on the quality of the diopter. Um, some diopters will give you super high quality on a standard zoom lens. Um, there are limitations, of course, but what I have here <coughs> this is a good example. So this is an Olympus with a, with a kit lens, which is a standard kit lens, which doesn't have very good reviews. It's not the, not the best lens. But if I put a wet, uh, a wet compact macro converter in this case on the front, then you can actually see the quality of the image here. Um, so I have that flexibility. I can, I can have my flip holder up, and then I can flip it down with my CMC on the front. Um, <coughs> The beauty of a setup like this is you can swap over. So here I've got my macro lens, and here I've got a wide wet lens. So I've taken off my macro lens, put it on my arm, and then I put my wide, wide lens on. And at the same time, I can actually shoot uh, a wide shot. Oh, wow. So yes, I think this is very flexible. Great. What is the most challenging aspect of shooting good macro photos? Ooh. That's a hard Probably one. a personal question. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's quite personal, really, isn't it? <laughs> I think, well, I guess uh, getting yourself into a position where you can go and take macro photography, really. But I think if your eyesight is, is not, not brilliant, then you need to think about getting LCD magnifiers. Because if you are relying on your own eyesight to get some focus, then um, it's quite important that, you're, that yeah. you do have either a viewfinder or, or, or good eyes. Is it that you like have something that you maybe by year or by you know, dive trip or whatever, focus on something that you want to? Sometimes you discover things and you get you know, something, catch your interest or mm. anything. Is there anything that you, you know, your next thing that you think you want to get a little bit more deeper into? Or? Um. For me, actually, I, 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 I do know people that do go on a dive and actually plan, plan that dive and plan that subject that they want. But for me personally, I enjoy the experience of diving so much that I don't mind what I find, really. I'm very spontaneous about what I'm, what I'm finding underwater. So I, I, I try not to get hung up, really. OK. <coughs> OK, last question. We're already over time, but this one we can still do. Anna is asking, when you are taking macro photos. Where do you generally place your strobes for limited backscatter and best possible lighting? OK, I think I showed you quite a lot of pictures of how I had my strobes for super macro. But if, um, if you have a subject which is very close to the lens, then you don't have to worry about backscatter. The backscatter comes as a result of the beam of light which comes out in a cone. Yeah. Uh, so. If you have your, if your subject's over here, and the cone of light goes across like this and lights all this water column, that's where the backscatter comes in. If you're very close to the subject, which you are generally with macro, unless you're doing like portraits or something, then you would have them like this. And as, you, as the subject moves back, or as you move away from the subject, then you turn them out and out and out. 
If the subject's a long way away, then I also put them forward on, on long arms like that. Ah, OK. But yeah, I mean, if, 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 if there's very little water column, then it, it backscatter's not a problem. OK. Cool. Ah, come on, one more. <laughs> How to handle with current while photographing macro? Huh. Pick but a different dive spot? <laughs> I guess it depends on how strong the current is. But I always try to encourage the guests that come on my trips that if there is a current, it can actually be your friend. As long as it's not like a howling, yeah. crazy current and you have to hang on like this. If you can find yourself in the lee of a rock, then you'll find that all the fish are lining up. Yeah, and you putting get on a show for you. Putting on a yeah. show for you. And, and yeah. their, their activity, their behavior is very different. So. If you can get yourself like settled down and hunkered down without damaging the environment behind something, then you can start working your way around and find, finding subjects. What you don't want to do is have, have a current coming along like this, and then you're photographing a subject in this direction, and then all the sediment or anything, that if you touch anything, is just floating in front of your camera. So you need to get behind the current or to the side of the current where the subject is. Great. Yeah. Alex? Good. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, we learned a lot. Thank you very much. This. And we will have a short 40 minute break. And then we have Andy Casagrande here on stage talking a little about shark conservation filmmaking. And Alex will be online and responding to whatever question you have about macro photography. Alex, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much thank you. Thank you, Alex.